we are back with someone who joined us from the RNC, a, a former uh, a Democratic candidate for president, and as I said during that stream, author of 450,000 books, Marianne Williamson, thank you for joining us. Well, thank you, but did you just say I was joining you from the RNC? No, you did join us from the RNC. Do you remember? Oh, yes, yeah, it was, was a you, Yes, it was called I, I Zoom. Been, I, it was a I've Zoom. I was trying to figure out what yes. were you talking yeah, about. Yeah, 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 yeah. no, right. Then yes. I redid. I yes, remember we did. Yes, we did. Yeah, fun. Tell me what you have made of the speeches of the convention so far. What's your general takeaway from it? I thought the talk tonight from the parents of the hostage, Hirsch, was very moving. You know, because I've run because I feel that I'm speaking from sort of the inside, the belly of the beast. Yeah. I see two separate universes. Yeah. Um, one universe is that which is for me, it's for many people, uh, a conviction that Donald Trump should not be president again. And therefore, uh, a decision that I will vote for. Uh, appears to be Kamala Harris seems to be the only. But... The hoopla of the machinery, uh, the performative uh, drama, I see as a product of a system that is very problematic. And even though we have an immediate issue here, which is to make sure in this case that Kamala wins, uh, on the other side of this, I feel that there's a deep-seated corruption within the political system that none of this hoopla, it's like whipped cream on top of some very, really corrupt and poisonous stuff, the political system in itself, that I see as a reflection of some of the worst aspects of our, of our modern culture. Can you, can you unpack that a little bit? Tell us about the poison, where exactly it is, how we could fight it. Well, you know, I, I used to feel that too often these political parties were representing the interests of huge corporate entities. Now I realize they are huge corporate entities. They're not just representing the interests of huge corporate entities. And they behave at times with the ruthlessness and the soullessness that we associate with too much of modern capitalism. I think there's such an ethical breakdown in our society. I think that in anything, the process by which you achieve a goal is as important as the goal and ultimately determines, you know, Gandhi said the end is inherent in the means. Modern politics has this ruthlessness, the end justifies the means, doesn't matter who, who we mess with. But as Gandhi said, the end is inherent in the means and there's this ethical carelessness, recklessness. And we talk about how, and I think this gets into much of what I've heard you talk about, we talk about how it's the dominance of money. It's more than that. It's the ethical breakdown in American society today. The things that are considered okay to do, and especially in politics. And uh, I see, and yet, for me, part of the ethical issue is that not time to talk about too much of that right now, however, because the biggest job is to make sure that Donald Trump is not president again. So there are many, it's like a, a circus with many rings yeah. uh, for yeah. someone like myself. Is, you know, for people who generally agree with that, with that analysis of American politics, I mean, you can't help but feel despair in some way that, you know, you are not somebody who's destitute. You have a, a name, people know who you are, you have money, you can raise money, and you just run into a wall. There's no way to get through it. So so those of us who can say I like- Can just add to the list yeah. of reasons that that is shameful is you had a platform that represents where the actual base of your party is at. That's right. And you brought love and spirituality, which we are all very much lacking to the process. So. I just wanted to add to your Yeah, I'm, la yes. I'm laughing too. I have no spirit. I'm just <laughs> To the I'm outrage of I'm how horrible. you were stonewalled. So we have to yeah, But you know, I mean, the, yeah. it's the boring but necessary question is that how do you fix this? Because you tried in the sense that you're running for the presidency of the United States mm -hmm. of America. And you know, as you say, that the Democratic Party, much like the Republican Party, are themselves corporations, right? There's so much with what you said and with what you said. Uh, first of all, 
the kind of money that I have and that I am able to raise is yeah. so minuscule compared yeah. to the amount of money that these, these machines are operating with. Um, that's number one. Number two, I think it's really interesting something you said, because I agree with what you said. What someone like myself is talking about is where people are. And when you said people despair, I would despair were it not for the fact that I get that the people are not the problem. Yeah. I traveled all over this country for the last year and a half. And remember, I, I did this before. The American people are ready for deep, true, real, noble, you know, we're hardwired to do great things in this country. I mean, we're a country that elected Abraham Lincoln. So I don't get that the American people aren't ready for depth. I mean, I've known this in my career for a long time. People hear you at the level you speak to them from. You have a real conversation about the Declaration of Independence. I don't care if it's Democrats or Republicans. They, like, lean in. Let's talk about what happened in 1776. Let's talk about what happened with women's suffragists and abolition and the founding of the, uh, of the labor movement and segregation and, and civil rights movement. The people are ready to get real, but there is institutional resistance mm -hmm. to the kind of depth that I think is the conversation we need to be having because nothing else is deep enough to sustain us. I'll give you an example. You're talking about all the rah-rah, happiness, joy. Mm -hmm. we, we need to be facing what a sober and sobering moment this is. People are dying because we're not getting it right. I'm not even saying who's not getting it right. That's not even the question. But that we're not getting it right. The people who are dying in Gaza and Israel, the people who are dying in Ukraine, the people who are dying deaths of despair, the opioid crisis, children afraid of guns. We're not. And, you know, I have a career that's been with people who, you know, the, the joke about me has been, you know, nobody calls Marianne when things are going well. <laughs> you know, it's when that's, that's just how my career developed yeah. because of my work with AIDS. Uh, somebody just got the, you know, the news, the test results came back. It's cancer. Your child is addicted to meth. Somebody died. And I've seen over and over again what happens when people get the worst news. Within five minutes, layers of meaningless, ultimately meaningless preoccupation just drop away. And people get really adult really fast and really mature really fast. And that's where this country is ready to be. But we have to get there. And I think the people are ready to get there. People, people know this isn't it. And so, once again, when this is over, no matter what happens, no matter who wins, I don't care what side of the political spectrum you're on, if you think that who, if your guy wins or your girl wins, no matter who it is, then everything is going to be great. Uh, we have to, something needs to, you know, I, I, I read about the idea that these are chaotic times, that there's chaos out of which will come a new order. But I think we have to be in a very wise and sober and serious and grown up. It's so immature. I think our, our main political conversation is not worthy of us, not deep Can enough. Can I ask you about Trump specifically? Because, um, you know, he came to a party, one of these corporate machines, the RNC, at a time when the party was, you know, neocon, pro-war, free trade, free market oriented, uh, anti-abortion, anti-gay and anti-union and he has sort of reshaped the party it's yeah. now anti-trade anti-war abortion states rights 15 weeks it's pro-gay he took the anti-abortion and anti-gay marriage language out of the the rnc's platform for the first time in 40 years he really took a wrecking ball to that corporate entity. Do you not find anything in that to admire, um, if not in terms of content, at least in terms of strategy? Oh, and the pro-union thing, having you know Sean O'Brien speak at the RNC, is there nothing there that sort of um, boosts your spirits about the possibility of such creative chaos and destruction um, towards more of a people-oriented platform? Well, first of all, I don't think it's a more people-oriented platform. Mm -hmm. But the first things that you were saying are the product of a powerful leader. Uh -huh. But there are powerful leaders who represent great moral advancement, mm -hmm. and there are powerful leaders that represent regression. Mm -hmm. And history is filled with both. So the fact that he was able to take an institution and reshape it, I, I will give you that. The idea that he's weak and ineffective is absurd. I'll give you that. Uh, from my perspective, when I think of um, the traditions, you know, uh, Eisenhower said that the American mind at its best is both liberal and conservative. I do get that there are high-minded conservative principles and high-minded liberal principles. I think he's run roughshod over high-minded conservative principles. 
So the fact that he's smashed the machine, which is, I do think, why so many people supported him to begin with. Uh, yeah, he smashed the machine. He had the power personality to do that. So did some of the worst people in history. So do I see any good in some of what he's done? Yeah, there are some places where I can say, oh, he got a point. I'm, I, I, that, that's not to be discounted. But in terms of his overall effect, uh, the fact his first of all, his pathological lying, uh, his, his character, his lack of any sense of serious, even understanding, much less respect for the traditions of American democracy. So those things override for me um, facts that every once in a while, I'll give it to you, I'll say, hmm, well, that's interesting yeah. that he said that, and I won't make fun of him for those things uh -huh. the way some of, you know, people on the left will do, uh -huh. including some things he said recently. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Marion, you obviously think the greatest danger to America right now is another Trump presidency. You also have a very dim view of the Democratic Party. <laughs> If Kamala Harris is the only kind of bulwark against another Trump administration, would you go out and campaign for her? Yes, and also, you just said I have a dim view of the Democratic Party. Yeah. I would actually- The machine, I should say that, right? Yeah, oh, yes, and I think that there's a misunderstanding on the part of the party. About, I grew up in a home where no matter what year it was, if there was an election and you asked my father, who'd you vote for, Daddy? He said Roosevelt. I mean, I grew up in a home that was so democratic and had been a Democrat all my life. I ran as a Democrat because I believe in the pillars, traditional pillars of the Democratic Party, which is namely that the powers of government can be used to help people. I'm, I'm a, in that sense, a Democratic traditionalist. So whereas some people within the Democratic Party today mm -hmm. look at someone like myself, like she's trying to hijack the party. No, they hijack the party. I represent the voices of Franklin and Eleanor. And to me, they represent the DuPonts and the Whitney's and the Morgan. People would say you're, you're trying to hijack the party. Nobody thinks I'm that powerful. No, I know. I, well, you but said you know the idea that yeah. people like. Her. I was going to say, who are yeah, these insane people? That, you know. No, uh, if you go into the convention hall, are you treated in a particular way? Do they, do they, they say, oh my God, this no, is Marianne? No, it's bigger than that. Like you. They wouldn't give me a ticket. Oh my God. Really? They wouldn't give me a ticket. Now listen to this. Oh my God. I did God. get, despite, so do I know, I know. It's, I, I'm laughing. It's so absurd. So, so let's let's like think about this. So this the way we, what we have is a political media industrial complex. So from the first day I announced this time, for, first of all, let's go back four years. I was given, I think, for a minor candidate. I think last time I was given. I mean, they make fun of me. They're going to make fun. I mean, you know, they're going to make. Yeah. But in general, I was on uh, CNN a fair amount, given that I was a minor candidate. Same with MSNBC. I got a CNN town hall. This time. Yeah. Get rid of it. There will be no opposition to to um, Joe Biden. I was I was blacklisted on CNN. I was blacklisted oh on um, on MSNBC. And that's you know, Tulsi Gabbard talks about that. It's a playbook. There was a decision. It would be Joe, and um, it was said that there was no other credible candidate. Though in their mind, you know, we're not. To me, the qualification yeah. should be the qualifications as articulated in the Constitution of the United States. I fit. Yeah. Also, this idea that we don't primary an incumbent. Well, I'm old enough to remember when Jean McCarthy primaried Lyndon Johnson. Nobody yeah. thought it was weird. We thought it was democracy. People primary incumbent senators and, and uh, Congress people and mayors. I mean, that's what you do in a democracy. But uh, so, yeah. And then despite all that, we got half a million votes. So how much more can I be in the process as a Democrat? And yeah, they wouldn't even give me a, it wouldn't even give me a ticket. I couldn't even get in. But you, but you I, still, I can't, I've been here in Chicago. I can't get in. But you still came. I came you to Chicago. To well, came to Chicago because I thought a lot of stuff was happening tickets. like this around it. Yeah. I wanted to be in. But then friends have said to me, well, we can't like <laughs> one woman who's working. She said, oh, I'm here and I'm doing stuff and I can get you in. And then two people, including a former head of the DNC, that I'll get you a ticket, both said to me, well, we need to know first that yeah. you're giving a full-throated endorsement yeah. of Kamala. Yeah. Oh, my God. Thank you, Baya. Thank you. This is thank you. This is Thank you. When, when thank I'm you. Thinking about thank this, you. And, like, thank you. and they call the other side dictators? Like, thank this you, is Baya. a dictatorship of, like, 
they're so terrified of her weakness, they will not let you in the building. No, it's kind of, it's so absurd. Oh my and, God. And, and, yes, I am voting for uh, Kamala. Well, that, that's what makes this even but more I don't upsetting. owe it to you to, what? Uh, because compare you to RFK Jr. And how he has behaved throughout this entire process. But I don't like what they're doing to him either. But mm -hmm. the lack of grace and the just, it, it's, this is so unacceptable. I mean, I cannot believe this. I mean, shock. Have you ever heard of anything like this? Yes. And by the way, <laughs> yes. by the For way. For hundreds of years I've heard of it, yeah. But, but I want to say something else here. If 500,000 people voted for me in a close election, don't you want those voters? No. Yeah. I mean, when I got out of the election last time, when I got up the race, Bernie Sanders called me. Uh, Elizabeth Warren called me three times to ask wow. if I would endorse. Last time was very different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. It's so upside down. It's supposed to, well, I have to prove to you, I think it's supposed to be the other way, you know? Yeah. And like I said, they're different rings and we can't have Donald Trump. So, uh, well, uh, Marianne Williamson, <laughs> you've come to Chicago. We hope that we see you breach the gates to get inside the United Center. I hope so. I mean, well, let's, uh, we'll, no. let's see what we can do. We, um, let's get some tickets for you. I said, get that's okay. I'll go do the free press. Yes, that exactly I'll right. go do the free press. You're you always welcome Yeah, here. thank you. Losing. Thank you, and I'd love to talk about some other things. And let's talk about Israel sometime. I'd love yes. to do that with you. Yeah. All right, well, Marianne Williamson, thank you very much thank for being you. here. And we talked so at the top of this of this uh, hour, wherever the hell we are with this very bizarre convention and the bizarre timing of it, we say only tell you by the day, the day of. We have no idea what's happening. RNC, by the way, they would tell you at 10 a.m. Yeah. Literally, it was like, you know, this one minute. speaking yeah. at 10.04 yeah. and this one speaking at, it was very organized. But we talked to, uh, at the top about um, the kind of, the patriotic vibe, the kind of trying to be a little more bipartisan. Which I and disputed. Which you disputed. <laughs> oh, wait, I have to add one more thing. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Well, I have to have one yeah. more thing, okay? Yeah. I was going to speak at a caucus today. It's called Progress Libs. I was not because I was told, are you ready? Drum roll, drum roll, yeah. drum roll. Oh, no. I'm too old. <gasps> we told you that? I know. I know. I know. I know. We got to make sure everybody has a voice. POC, LGBTQ, trans, yeah. you know, everybody's got to have a voice, which I agree. But meanwhile, half of America's seniors are living on less than $28,000 a year. It is absolutely a crisis in their lives when they don't have uh, hearing aids, glasses, dental. But no, you can't speak, you're too old. They didn't say that about Joe Biden that for very long time, That wasn't the DNC, time, the but it was someone in the, one of the issues around, oh and I thought, oh my God. Yeah. I, I can't even, I'm yeah. even kicked out yeah. of the, of the, the oh ring around the thing. Yeah, so thanks for having me on, guys. Well, we had Marianne Williams <laughs> on, uh, despite her age, because we're not, we don't discriminate like that. <laughs> We love her. We love her 85,000 books that sell 80 million copies apiece. Uh, check them out. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you for having me.